take your Bibles and uh, turn to the Gospel of Luke this morning. Luke 23, and uh, we're going to look at a number of passages this morning, but this is sort of our, our launching point, Luke 23 and verse 46. It's good to be back with you. We had a, a good trip down to Ecuador, and uh, I know you, uh, you, many of you saw us last week via Skype, uh, but my understanding was that the, uh, the video was good, but the audio not so much. Um, so uh, sorry about that. We had uh, kind of hoped to sort of rehearse that on Saturday evening and then make sure we had all the bugs worked out of it for Sunday morning. But uh, we had internet issues down in Ecuador, so we couldn't do that. So we didn't have the chance to work some of the bugs out of that. So we're going to be sharing with you a little bit more about uh, what went on down there. So be looking for some information uh, in the next week or two. Uh, I'll be going in your church mailboxes about that. But uh, continue to pray. Uh, great plans are going forward forward uh, with LaFay uh, launching a daughter church, and uh, we're excited about what's going to be taking place over the next 12 months uh, in regard to that, and uh, we want to inform you about that so you're aware, uh, so we will be getting some information to you about that, so you know what's going on, be praying about that, and uh, yeah, so we're excited about the good things that God is doing. Uh, LaFay Church down in Cuenca, Ecuador is a, a partner church of ours. It's a church that we've had a partnership with uh, missionally for a number of years, uh, but we've really sort of put a lot more resources into that partnership in the last four to five years, and uh, as many of you know, um, they are in the process of, of planting a daughter church uh, there in the city of Cuenca. Uh, Cuenca is a city of about uh, uh, 500 to 600,000 people, uh, and really just a handful of evangelical churches, so a great opportunity to be planting churches throughout that city, and uh, uh, LaFay is on the north end of town, and they've purchased a piece of property on the south side of town, uh, which is where they're going to eventually construct a church, plant a church, start a church, and uh, we as a church family had the privilege of, uh, we have the privilege of being involved in that, uh, but while we were down there, as many of you know, uh, we have given them a loan uh, to go toward the purchase of that property, an interest-free loan, uh, so we were able to uh, take that down with us and present that to them uh, last Sunday, and to spend a uh, about a day and a half just planning and strategizing uh, about that whole process. Uh, it's not just our church and Lafay Church. Uh, God has brought a third church involved in the partnership, uh, Beacon Baptist Church out in Syracuse, New York, and uh, hopefully we'll be hearing more about them and about their involvement. So now really we're going to have four churches involved. We're going to have Lafay, we're going to have the new church plant, uh, Midway and Beacon, uh, all kind of involved in uh, seeing what God can do there in the city of Cuenca, uh, down in Ecuador over the next uh, number of years. So be praying about that, and like I said, we'll get some more information to you uh, here in the next week or so about that, so you can kind of understand a little more about what's going to be going on, particularly over the next 12 months, and then beyond that, as this, uh, this new church is launched. All right, well, talking about missions, um, you know, I heard a missionary share a story many, many years ago. Uh, in fact, I think it was when I was a young person. I heard a missionary share a story. Uh, this was a missionary to Africa. And they were sharing a story about the, the, the African culture in which they served, in which they ministered. And they were talking about the, the, the national Christians. And uh, I don't remember the context exactly, but for some reason they were, they were talking about that when the, the national Christians in Africa pass away when they die, die, it is sort of their desire, it's sort of their prayer that they die what they call a good death, a good death. Now, when you and I hear that phrase, good death, we would probably think of something like maybe uh, dying without pain or dying in old age, or maybe uh, dying at home, uh, you know, in, in a place that we're accustomed to. Uh, when they talk about good death, they meant something kind of different than that. For them, a uh, good death really didn't have a lot to do with pain or that kind of thing. A good death meant that they had one final opportunity to sort of gather their family around them and to sort of have the, the mental capacity to speak some final words of blessing some final words of challenge to their family, to challenge them to live for the Lord, to challenge them to, to make sure that they're, they're prepared for eternity. And if they had that, that final chance to speak those final words to their family, then they said, that's a good death. 
That's a good thing. Now we're ready to go. You know, I kind of wonder if we were, uh, if you and I were given the chance to, uh, to kind of experience what they would define as a good death, I wonder what our final words would be. I mean, not that I, I want us all imagine that today, like we're all thinking about passing away this week. But, you know, if you thought about it, if, you know, if it was your time to go, if it was the time of your passing, I mean, you know, what would be the, the final words that you would want to come out of your mouth, that you would want to share with, with your loved ones, your friends, your family that might be, be there with you? Well, this morning we want to talk a little bit about Jesus' final words. The very, very last words out of his mouth before he died, before he passed away. And they're given to us in Luke chapter 23 and verse 46. In Luke 23, verse 46, we just have these final words of Jesus before he died, simple words of submission, and they simply are, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. By this point in time, uh, Christ's suffering was over. It was done. By this point in time, his sacrifice was over. It had been paid in full. He was finally able to sort of surrender or submit or commit his soul, his spirit, into the hands of God the Father. And those were his final thoughts. Those were his final words. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So certainly Jesus died a good death. And his final words remind us of some valuable things. And so what I want us to do this morning before we celebrate communion together is look at the, these final words of Christ and see, kind of look at them and see what do they say about Jesus. And then secondly, to sort of draw from them some important lessons on submission that we can apply to our own lives. So we want to look at what those words meant for Christ and what they mean for us. All right, that's what we want to do this morning. All right, so look at, Let's look, first of all, at what those final words meant to Christ. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Well, number one, they meant that Christ died in the Father's presence. He died in the Father's presence. Um, his last cry from the cross really expressed what I think is a very strong confidence that uh, he would be welcomed back into heaven. And when you think about the hours that he spent on the cross, the opening three hours that he spent on the cross, he was experiencing all of the insults and all of the attacks, and he suffered under the hands of men. But it was during the next three hours on the cross that he was separated from God the Father while he became sin for us. It was during those three hours that he cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't Father then, it was God then. And it wasn't into your hand I commit my spirit, it's why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? But now, now, the very last thing that he said, he cried out, Father, because no longer was there separation. No longer was he forsaken. Soon he and God the Father would be reunited as they had been from eternity past and they would be for eternity future. So we have a sense here in this final statement of Jesus, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit that, that, that all the suffering was gone, that the sacrifice was paid in full, that the fellowship was restored, that no longer was he forsaken. And so in this, this final phrase of Jesus, we have this sense that it's finished. It's done. Everything was paid in full. It was completed. It was finalized. And because everything was done, he's ready to go. He's ready to turn his soul over to God the Father. That's what he's ready to do. So he died in the Father's presence. Second thing I see here is that uh, that phrase, it also reminds us that he died in the Father's providence. He died in the Father's providence. You know, there were a number of times in the Gospels when Jesus shared with people that, that he was basically in control of his own life, that nobody was going to take his life from him, that he was going to be the one that would lay down his life of his own will, of his own volition. I mean, we find that over in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, Jesus was talking and he said, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. So when Jesus died, he died at the appointed time. He died in the appointed way. His death was an act of 
personal volition, a choice that he made within the providential purpose and providential plan of God. He was totally in control. Totally in control. Now I know when we read the scene from Scripture, sometimes it doesn't seem that way, right? I mean, when, the, when the, the, the group came, when the crowd came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, it seemed like they were in control. And you remember Peter had this short little sword that he took out and he, he kind of whacked off one of the ears of one of the soldiers and, and Jesus picked it up and he, and he healed that soldier and restored that ear. And he, he sort of looked at Peter and said, that, you, know, uh, you know, lighten up. You know, I'm in control here. You know, we're in charge here still. You don't need to worry about that, Peter. Or you remember when he stood before Pilate, uh, that uh, Pilate looked at Jesus, and, and Pilate wanted Jesus to know that, that he was in control. But Jesus reminded Pilate, no, no, Pilate, you're not in control, that I'm really in control. In fact, in John chapter 19, verse 10, we read, So Pilate said to Christ, Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered Pilate, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. So the fact is, only what God the Father and God the Son had agreed upon would come to pass. So he died in the Father's providence. This was all the outworking of God's providential purpose and providential plan. It was, it was under God's control. And so he delivered up his spirit to the Father because he had fully absorbed God's wrath. Because all the prophecies had been fulfilled. Because the agreed upon schedule for Christ's time on earth had been completed. So his death was not an accident. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't like, uh-oh, that's not what we planned. No. His death was a providential appointment. Jesus died according to the perfect purposes of divine providence. And the same is true for you and me. In the end, we will not die according to the will of cancer. We will not die according to the will of a drunk driver. We will not die according to our own will or even according to the will of old age. In the end, we will die under the providential purposes of God. God will take everything that happens to us and he will work it all together to accomplish his sovereign purposes and his providential plan. We can rest assured in that. What was true for Christ, that's also true for us. So he died, he died in the Father's providence. Another thing I notice here when uh, we look at this phrase, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, is that, um, that he died in the Father's hands. He died in the Father's hands. Now, at first reading, that doesn't seem like much, but if you ever read through the last few chapters of each of the Gospels and you read the narrative of Christ's death, it seems like hands are talked about a lot in those final chapters. Uh, for instance, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 46, verse 45 and 46, Jesus says to his disciples, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Later on, we learn that wicked hands arrested and hauled away Jesus. That wicked hands formed a crown of thorns and forced it into his skull. That wicked hands whipped and lacerated his back and chest. That wicked hands punched him and beat him. That wicked hands put nails through his hands and his feet. That wicked hands hung him on a wooden cross. But this verse is reminding us, this final statement of Jesus is reminding us that there came a point in time when the hands of men could do nothing more and God's hands had the final say. Even though Jesus was surrounded by people that hated him, and even though Jesus was fully aware of the injustice that was being committed against him, even though Jesus understood that most of his disciples had, for the most part, deserted him, he could still count on God the Father. He could still count on God the Father's hands. And you know, the same is true for you and I. I love the verses in John chapter 10 where Jesus said, and it's recorded in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than I, or greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Is that a great thought to know that we if we're a follower of Christ, if we are in Christ, that we are not only held in the hand of Christ, but we are held in the hand of God the Father. I mean, that's pretty secure, right? 
Can you think of a, a more secure place to be in than to know that, that your life, your future, your day, your circumstances, everything about your life, your career, your education, everything is held in, in the Son of God's hand and God the Father's hand, and that the Son of God says, nothing can take you out of that hand. Whatever the circumstances might be, you know, if you're held in God the Father and God the Son's hand, that, that's, I mean, you talk about the good hands people, right? I mean, there, there's no better hands than to be in, in those hands. And so even though Christ died surrounded by so many that hated him, and he died knowing that most of his disciples had deserted him, you know, he could still count, even in that moment, he could still count on being securely in the Father's hands. So Christ died in the Father's presence, died in his providence, died in his hands. You know, when I think about that, I think about that, you know, what was true for Christ in his death is actually true for us in every day of our life. Do you ever stop and recognize the fact that every day we live our life in the Father's presence? Every day. He promises us that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He tells us in his word that uh, when the Lord is our shepherd, we'll never be in want, that he will lead us to the green pastures, he'll lead us to the quiet waters, but even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he'll be what? With us. He'll be with us. He promises we're never out of his presence. You know, God tells us in his word that he is omnipotent. That means that he's all-powerful. We're told that he's omniscient, he knows everything. But as wonderful as those truths are, maybe the most precious truth is the fact that he's omnipresent, that he is everywhere present at all times completely. That means every moment of every day he is completely with you and completely with me. He's completely with every one of us. I can't, I can't figure that out. I have a hard enough time being completely in one place at any given time, right? I mean, getting the mental and the physical all in the same place at the same time, that doesn't always work. That's not an issue with God, right? I mean, God is everywhere present at all times completely. We live every day of our lives in the presence of God. So every day when we wake up, we can, like with Christ, say, Father, this is a day when, when I put myself in your hands. I entrust my life to your hands because I know that you are going to be with me every moment of every day, whatever the circumstances, whatever the situation, whatever the schedule calls for today. Whatever I'm up against, whatever the highs or the lows might be, I know, I know that you are going to be with me. I know that I'm going to be in your presence. You know, another thing we can claim every day is that every day we live in the Father's providence. And now, again, I know, you know, we pick up a newspaper or we look at a news app on our, our phone or on our tablet or something, or we listen to some news on the radio. And, and to be honest with you, it seems like, you know, the, the world is sort of just sort of going off in all kinds of directions. And we just sort of shudder a little bit and we sort of shake our heads and wonder, you know, where this all is going to go. And, you know, as we, we think of all the things that are happening in our world, not only in the Middle East, but, uh, you know, in other places across Asia, even here in the United States with upcoming elections and all that, you know, so many things seem to be kind of going astray. But, you know, we come back to the Word of God and we come back to this lesson from Christ and we realize that as much as it seems that way from, from our human frame of reference, from our human perspective, the Bible is very clear that God is taking all things, all things, and He is working them together to accomplish His good purposes, working them all together to accomplish His providential plan. So when I get up in the morning and I face the day, or as I'm going through the day and circumstances intersect my life, be they good circumstances or hard circumstances, whatever they might be, I can always rest in the fact that God is taking all these things and working them through his purposes to accomplish his providential plan, not only for my life, but for all of the universe. And I have that kind of father that every day I know he's working things out according to his providential plan. Folks, that ought to give us a sense of comfort and peace. It ought to give us a sense that, that we can sort of rest submissively in his purposes for our life today, even though I can't see it all, right? 
I can't see where everything is going. I can't see how all that's going to work out. But I have a, a father who can see. I mean, if you just took the narrative of Christ's death and if you just took it at face value, it looked like things were just careening out of control, right? I mean, this should not be happening to the Son of God. He should not be facing this. He should not be going through this. Come on, God the Father, it's time to call a time out and sort of jump into the scene and change things around. But you get to the end of the story and you have an aha moment and you realize, wow, God was working. His purposes were being accomplished. His providential plan was being fulfilled in spite of a scene that seems so tragic and maybe seems so out of control. So every day we live in the Father's presence. Every day we live in the Father's providence. Every day, according to John 10, we live in the Father's hands. Uh, let, me, let me just read the verse again uh, from John 10, verse 27. Jesus is speaking. Our Lord and Savior says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Folks, when we get up in the morning and we think of all the circumstances of our day and everything that maybe went on the day before, the week before, the month before, or everything that's about to happen that day or that week or that month, you know, we, we need to rest assured and know that in Christ, if we're a follower of Christ, that we are held confidently and securely and lovingly and tightly, not only in the hand of God the Son, but in the hand of God the Father. I mean, again, you talk about the you know, the good hands people, right? There's nothing, nothing more, more faith building or confidence building or more security building, more comforting or peace building than that reality that we live every day of our lives in the Father's hands and in the Son's hands. So we can learn some things from Christ here. That just like he died in the Father's presence and providence and hands, we live every day of our lives in the Father's presence, in the, pro in, in the Father's providence, and in the Father's hands. But let me share with you, kind of as we wrap this up and as we head into communion, just a couple of final lessons. Since this was Christ's final statement, and it was immediately followed by his death, you know, what are some lessons that we, we take away that kind of help us to be submissive as maybe, you know, we look at our lives and, and we look at the fact that our lives are, are not, you know, endless here on earth, that they have, a, they have a, an end date here on earth. So let me share three things with you. Number one, death is not our final chapter. It is simply the end of our introduction. Death is not our final chapter. It's simply the end of our introduction. You know, remember I referenced that missionary a while ago at the beginning of the message that talked, they served in Africa and they talked about that the, the national Christians there in Africa, that they want to die a good death and what that meant that they were surrounded by family could speak those final words. Well, this missionary, I remember also sharing something else about them. That they would share, these national believers in Africa, they would share that, that, that when a fellow believer died, they would, never, they would never speak in terms of, well, he or she departed. You know, we, we do that sometimes, don't we? You know, we, we lost a loved one. We're here to remember our, our dearly departed loved one. They never use that phrase. They never would talk about he or she departing. They would always use the phrase, he or she has arrived. Because, you know, they, they looked at life from a bit of a different perspective. They recognized that what we live here is barely the introduction to our existence, right? We got all of eternity, right? That's the real book of our lives. That's the real book of our existence. So as we think of this life, let's think of it as, as, as merely the introduction. It is sort of the, 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 the prelude. It is sort of the, 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 the prologue to, to everything that God has planned for his people. So let's think about those terms. That life on this earth is merely the introduction. That doesn't mean it's not important. But it also means that what we do here is merely preparation for what is really our true lives for all of eternity on the other side of death. So death is not our final chapter. It's simply the end of our introduction. Here's a second thing. All of us end up in the hands of God. 